Today, Taoism isn't hard to come across, whether it's in a movie or just on YouTube. It is often described simply as ancient Chinese wisdom. However, in many ways, Taoism is not ancient, rather it is a living tradition and philosophy. Thus, through this video, we will examine the birth, growth, decay, and restoration of Taoism. I will be using the Norton Anthology of World Religions Taoism, composed by James Robson as the reference. I would highly suggest picking up the book itself if you are very interested in Taoism. It is a wonderful source that offers a wide range of primary sources on Taoism compiled with digestible but not overbearing commentary and analysis. If there's any piece of this video that you should watch, it's the section on Taoism's most recent history. It has most significance to today. Timestamps are in the description. Before venturing into the history of Taoism, it must first be noted that the boundaries of what we call Taoism are hard to define. So if you feel the need to correct me, or to offer your opinion, feel free to do so. But let's just jump into it. Karl Jaspers, the German philosopher, would label the years 800 to 200 BCE as the Axial Age for its importance around the globe. But even preceding the so-called Axial Age was the I Ching. One cannot speak of classical Chinese thought without mentioning the I Ching, a book that was a divination text incorporating hexagrams. It became interpreted as a cosmological text during the Warring States period, which comes later. The I Ching would later be expanded on in the Seal of the Unity of the Three, which contains within it essential alchemical knowledge for attaining immortality, which becomes a massive component in later organized Taoism. Approaching the 4th century BCE, the Zhou dynasty was falling apart. This led to the fractioning of China in a time known as the Warring States period. The fighting and conflict lent into the creation of many new ideas. Thus, out of the Warring States period would rise the hundred schools of thought, including Moism, Confucianism, Legalism, and more. What has taken the label of Taoism emerged from this period as well. The Taoist texts compiled during the Zhou and Xin dynasties are that which are most familiar to us today. The date is uncertain, but around 650 BCE is when scholars believe that the Tao Te Ching, we have come to know as the central Taoist text, was composed. Jing means classic or scripture, Tao meaning the way or natural order depending on your interpretation, and De meaning virtue or power. The Tao Te Ching's attributed author, Lao Tzu, was said to be a bookkeeper who on his way out of China was stopped and asked to write down his wisdom, thus creating the Tao Te Ching. It has most often been understood as a text on either self-cultivation or on governance. See my video on Taoism and Libertarianism for my interpretation. Around 400 BC is when Zhuangzi is said to have finished his work, which has since become understood in the West as the second greatest text of Taoism. The original text was composed of 52 chapters, but Guo Zhang discarded chapters he deemed superstitious and unnecessary in the 4th century CE. One can only imagine how such a treatment changed the interpretation of the text between its original creation and our modern interpretation. The Zhuangzi shifts the focus from where the Tao Te Ching had set it from society and politics to exclusively self-cultivation. Zhuangzi is the first to mention perfected persons and transcendence the two that would become crucial to organize Taoism in the future. The text is highly critical of other warring states' philosophies like Confucianism and Mois. Other key texts from this time that require mention include the Huainanza, the Neya, the Lietza, and the Hanfetza. Although it must be acknowledged that the Taoists were not the only ones speaking about the Tao or Wei as we've come to translate it. The other philosophies of the time also sought to articulate the proper way as was needed during a time of war. Some of it is harmonious with the understanding that, that developed within Tao's tradition and other parts of it were not. In the immediate time following its writing, the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi were not seen as ineffable philosophical wisdom. Rather, they both went largely ignored. It wouldn't be until Sima Tan would come late into the 2nd century BCE that Taoism would be seen as an intellectual system to be compared with Confucianism, Legalism, and more.
However, it wouldn't be until the Han Dynasty that Taoism would become an organized religion. During this period, Taoism saw its beginnings as an organized religion and its new relationship with the idea that had just come from the West, Buddhism. The Way of Great Peace, beginning in around 180 CE, grew with the Yellow Turban Rebellion in the eastern part of China. Inspired by the scripture of Great Peace, or Taiping Jing, they sought to bring back a period of harmony and peace to the nation through more equal distribution of wealth, healing through the ingestion of talismans and confessions. However, when the Yellow Turban Rebellion was crushed, the Way of Great Peace was crushed along with it. Following the Han Dynasty's decline, Chinese elites moved south, carrying Taoism with them. The way of the celestial masters holds that their beginning was when the deified Lao Tzu, more of this shortly, visited Zhang Daoling in 142 CE and bestowed him as a celestial master. The way of the celestial masters would go on to endure through time, influencing other Tao schools, and is still present today. The Celestial Masters would also be the first to treat the Tao Te Ching as a holy scripture, following its commentary known as the Xiang Er Commentary, which heavily focused on immortality. Now, Buddhism enters the picture. Despite having existed for centuries, it wasn't until this period when Buddhism would penetrate deep into Chinese society. Celestial Masters would develop or influence two following Taoist schools, Upper Clarity and numinous treasure. The upper clarity movement began in reaction to large amounts of northern Chinese aristocrats heading south, forcing those who previously had power in the south to quote unquote need celestial compensation throughout the movement. The upper clarity movement would synthesize elements of the celestial masters tradition with Buddhism and local religious tradition. Numinous treasure was similar to upper clarity in that it synthesized the celestial masters tradition with Buddhism, but this time Mahayana Buddhism in particular. Its primary text was the array of the five numinous treasure talismans of the Most High, which emphasized the use of talismans along with the possibility of immortality. The tradition also adopted the emphasis on the chanting of texts that was so prominent to Mahayana Buddhism. A crucial development of organized Taoism is the deification of Lao Tzu. Following the appearance of a number of texts that stated contradictory times of Lao Tzu's life, rather than rejecting some and settling on one time frame during which Lao Tzu lived, Taoists accepted them all. For Lao Tzu was no longer just an archivist, he was understood as an immortal or god who could transcend time. Following after the example of alchemy mentioned as a result of the I Ching, organized Taoism practiced alchemy in search of immortality. Of special importance was cinnabar, which when heated turns into mercury, and if consumed as mercury, one attains immortality. Buddhism, which had spread through Southern Asia, really penetrated the depths of Chinese society during the Six Dynasties period, which would drastically change the religious makeup of China. But it did not do so without contention with Taoism. During this time arose the story of the, quote, the conversion of the barbarians, which would state that the Buddha was actually Lord Lao, or deified Lao Tzu, bringing Taoism to the so-called barbarians in the West. But Buddhists would fire back. However, Buddhism, Buddhism's introduction would not result solely in competition, as we have seen in the aforementioned Taoist schools, as we can see in the subsequent Buddhist schools like Chan Buddhism. Uh, one must not forget that during this time, Specifically in the, in the early 3rd century, Wang Bi's Confucian and Buddhist commentary on the Tao Te Ching would highly influence our interpretation of the text even today. The, the Sui dynasty, having a short time in power, went rather well for Taoists. Despite having emperors who favored Buddhism, Taoist temples and practices were accepted and supported by the state. The Tang Dynasty was the beginning of a Taoist historical high point. Large new Taoist schools did not emerge as had in the centuries before. Instead, they consolidated and grew. In the 7th century, Tang Dynasty ruler, Emperor Gaozong, even called for the creation of the first Taoist canon and added the Tao Te Ching 
to the imperial examinations. But the best time for Taoists, under the rule of the Tong, was during Zhuangzong's reign, giving Taoists many rights to perform state rituals. During this period, many Taoist-Buddhist hybrid texts were created, and meditation became more important to Taoists. Chan, a Chinese form of Mahayana Buddhism, would draw on and adopt Taoist ideas. In the Seal of the Unity of the Three, written by a Chan monk, focused on alchemical practices, just as its in inspiration had the previously mentioned Seal of the Unity of the Three, some 700 years before. This period also marked a transition of elixir alchemy, or Waidan, to internal alchemy, or Nedan. Thus, the attainment of, of immortality was interiorized and included meditation, as can be seen in the scripture on inner observation by the Most High Lord Lao, and as we will subsequently see. While the copies of the Tao Te Ching that were sent to Tibet and India during this time are not well known about, the opposite is true of Korea and Japan. Within Japan, Taoism would fail to catch on due to its great similarities with the already pervasive Shinto. But Taoism, particularly Inner Alchemy and Buddhism, would flourish in the Korean Peninsula. Taoism under the Song and Yuan dynasties thrived. State support for Taoism throughout the Song dynasty was strong, but peaked under the reign of Emperor Huizong, who oversaw the production of the first printed edition of the Taoist canon in 1119. Following Huizong's reign, state support for Taoism decreased, while Taoism spread further through society, incorporating local cults, which led to many new practices, like the Thunder Ritual. In 1239, the Song Dynasty would require the 35th Celestial Master to unify the Orthodox Unity tradition with its roots in the school of the Celestial Masters, along with Upper Clarity and Numinous Treasure bringing the largest Taoist institutions together under orthodox unity. Taoism in the Yuan Dynasty. More schools would develop, including the most important of the time, the Way of Complete Perfection. But a great hit would come when Kublai Khan would order the recent Taoist canon to be burned. But this offered new opportunities for Taoism to become something new, including new schools and new ideas. Neo-Confucianism would be a syncretism of the three teachings, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, and would gain lots of popularity at this time. Taoism adopted thunder rituals from local Chinese religions. These were powerful exorcistic rituals intended to harness the power of thunder and summon thunder deities. The powers harnessed during the rituals could be used in a variety of ways, including expelling evil, averting calamities, and opening the gates of hell and setting free the dead. Once again, new forms of Taoism spread through China. There was Divine Empyrean, Celestial Heart, Pure Tenuity, Youthful Incipience, Pure and Luminous Way of Loyalty and Filial Obedience, and Complete Perfection, to name a few. This last one, Complete Perfection, thrived during the Mongol rule of the Yuan, Yuan Dynasty. Complete Perfection Taoists adopted a monastic structure that much resembled that of Buddhism. It was not only in monastic structure that complete perfection Taoists resembled Buddhism, but their canon took scriptures from the Heart Sutra and the Confucian classic of filial piety. Alchemy, under complete perfection, was focused inward, and immortality no longer was a physical trait. It became a psychological realization like that of Buddhist nirvana. The way of complete perfection would be one of the two Taoist schools that would survive until today. Taoism has not seen the same heights as it had during the Tang, Song, and Yuan dynasties. Taoism accepted the, the strict control of the Ming dynasty while spreading new and different philosophical and religious thoughts and practices throughout China. The trends set in the previous periods, like the interiorization of alchemy and synthesis of the three teachings of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, would continue. The founder of the Ming dynasty, Taizu, would take up a personal interest in Taoist immortality, an interest that would lead to his tenth son's death of mercury consumption. In 1445, the Ming edition of the Taoist canon would be completed and serve as the basis of all modern editions. The Qing dynasty would not bode well for Taoism as a result of the West, which I will touch on shortly, but during the Qing dynasty, Taoism penetrated lay life, the lives of the common people. 
Complete perfection would grow considerably and its longman branch would gain fame. A great focus would be placed on the Taoist self-cultivation practices of internal alchemy, female alchemy, and sexual self-cultivation. Internal alchemy carried on as previously described while female alchemy offered alchemical practices specific to female physiology. Sexual self-cultivation involves subduing the white tiger and beheading the red dragon. Both suggest that along with the loss of bodily fluids is a loss of one's vital chi. Matteo Ricci would be the first to influence the West's perception of Taoism. Ricci was a Jesuit that lived in China from 1583 to his death in 1610 that developed a deep learning of Chinese language and Chinese culture. Him and other Jesuits concluded that Confucianism, which they understood as solely a political and social philosophy, was of more value to the West than Buddhism and Taoism, both of which they were critical of for a perceived lack of monotheism. The study of Chinese culture by Western missionaries would be put on a halt as a result of the rights controversy and the following opium wars, through which Taoism and all of China would suffer. In 1898, the emperor would act to promote modernization and eradicate religious and superstitious institutions and practices. Roughly 500,000 Taoist temples, Buddhist monasteries, and local shrines were destroyed or repurposed in the first few decades of the 20th century. This period is key to the question of how Taoism went from largely an institutional practice to being understood as most today is ancient Chinese wisdom, or a life philosophy. Throughout the course of the 20th century, Taoism would dance for its life between three labels, superstition, religion, and philosophy. Taoism, as it entered the 20th century, was focused on internal alchemy, ritual practices, and the like within Taoist schools or institutions. In Taoism, a prize essay written in 1893, one can see the critiques of the popular Taoism at the time that would play out throughout the next century. The essay stated that Taoism had lost its way from the pure teachings of Lao Tzu and become a, quote, degenerate religion focused on magic, miracles, charms, incantations, and beliefs about an elixir of mortality. In 1912, the Republic of China was founded in the model of Western republics as a result of pressure for the westernization of China. These pressures were not just for the Chinese government, but for all of Chinese society. What was labeled as superstition was no longer acceptable. And as a result, Taoism was reshaped in the image of Western liberalism to fit that of a religion. The way of complete perfection even instituted Sunday services to mimic those of Christianity. During this point, the downplaying of superstition and the highlight of philosophy or religion worked. When the Chinese Republic would adopt a Western idea of freedom of religion, Taoism would fall within the five state-recognized religions during a time when superstitious groups were being outlawed. Through the Republican era, Taoist science and philosophy thrived while the rest of Taoism was thrown to the side. But the influence of Western Marxism would pose a whole new and greater challenge for Taoism. Karl Marx was no fan of religion, having described it as the opium of the people. When Mao and other Marxists came to power in China, Taoism's relabeling of superstition to religion was not enough. Taoism and other religions were crushed. Mao's great leap forward would bring a temporary end to the remaining Taoist institutions. Luckily, Taoism was not gone for good. Through the 1980s and the 1990s, there would be a restoration of Taoism and Taoist temples. Grassroots Taoism, hybrid movements, and the way of complete perfection would return, though changed forever. While this happened in the origin country of Taoism, Taoism spread as a philosophy and religion throughout the rest of the world. When the nationalists fled to Taiwan in 1949, the 63rd Celestial Master accompanied them. Outside of Asia, the Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi had already been translated numerous times, often as a philosophical text. During the Western New Age movement in the 1970s, these Taoist texts were understood to be metaphysical. Friedhof Kopra would write in the Tao of Physics that Taoism had already known much of what modern science was just discovering. The internal alchemy practices of the Tao became popular in the West, all while being combined with meditation and breathing exercises. Most recently, Taoist texts have been understood in an ecological light, stressing the importance of living in harmony with nature. 
it is safe to say that Taoism has caught on in the West. Robson ends his final introduction stating, even as the formal institutions of Chinese Taoism may be fading, philosophical ideas drawn from classical texts that long predate those institutions are supporting Taoism as a world religion. And so, I'd like to end this history with a contemporary question. We've seen what the Tao has been and meant for over two millennia. My question to you is, what is the Tao today? And what is it to you? I hope that this widespread of texts, schools, and ideas satisfied you. There is a lot covered in this video, but far more left out. If you think there's something missing, let me know what it is and why. Thank you for watching, and until next time.